Good morning, and thank you, Clark, for that introduction. Uh, my name is Roy Ashok. I'm Daiquiri's CEO. Um, you know, and, I'm, and I really want to spend some time talking today about how Daiquiri is deploying AR in enterprises worldwide today. Um, you know, first, a little bit about Daiquiri. Uh, you know, we've been around actually since 2013. Uh, we're headquartered in Los Angeles. Uh, we do a lot of our hardware design and optics and computer vision uh, overseas in Europe, uh, in Vienna, in the UK, and Dublin as well. You know, we have been researching and developing AR technologies and experiences for a long time now. And for the last year or so, we've developed a platform uh, that includes some device and software uh, that we have now deployed in enterprises worldwide. So a lot of this is, you know, even I've been associated with, with AWE, I think, since its inception. And a lot of companies here have been researching and these technologies. And I think, finally, they're now being deployed. Uh, so it's very interesting to see that evolution. Uh, we're certainly not a consumer company, although the technologies we have are quite relevant in those spaces, what we're really focused on is what we call professional grade AR for enterprises. Because if you look at an enterprise, you know, as much as there's AI and automation and these trends have existed for decades, um, it's all about the workforce. And I choose that word very, very deliberately and carefully. Uh, I'm not actually saying worker, I'm saying workforce. Uh, and it's a critical distinction because um, this is not about empowering one worker. This is about connecting m m uh, all workers. Uh, it's about connecting them to their tasks, to the systems they have, to the assets they use every day, not creating dramatically new assets, um, but also getting insights from how they work together uh, as they collaborate, and then providing that to supervisors and managers and sort of making the whole workforce quite effective. So our mission at Daiquiri is really quite simple. We want to make workforces much more effective with professional grade AR. And AR is quite fundamentally a disruptive technology um, that can dramatically increase productivity in this space. So where is AR actually a good fit? And this is actually, you know, I, I get this question all the time, and you know, when you talk to uh, customers or innovators in the space, and you, 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 know, you go to the uh, expo area, you'll see beautiful demos in AR. But the way we look at it, in enterprise, when you have high value assets and you have really complex tasks, the intersection of those two, that's where AR is actually useful. That's where it's repeatable, that's where it brings real value. And a high value asset, um, you know, examples are industrial vehicles, uh, an assembly line, a facility, a building, a production floor. All of these are assets, right? And they have, uh, they're extremely complex to operate. They have many moving parts. You have multiple people working on each of these. You design, you build them, you retrofit them, uh, and you operate and maintain them. And these tasks, if you think about them, are quite chronic in nature. You know, you, you do them again and again and again, uh, and, and, and the complexity of it, you know, causes whether it's errors or you want to do it faster. And that intersection is where companies spend billions of dollars trying to make it less error-prone, faster, and more productive. And that's where AR really has a lot of value. So today, you know, we have more than 120 customers deploying AR. So this is not, this is not something that's uh, in an innovation lab uh, or, or a science project or something that you want to show at a trade show to impress your boss, but this is something that's actually being used in production workflows today. And, you know, really for us, what we see, these are the three trends. It's training, field services, and facilities management. You know, training's a no-brainer. Like, you do something with... Uh, the, the traditional training technique in, in, in a particular way, in, uh, however it is done today, and then you use AR, the learning outcomes are significantly better, it's faster, um, it's, and there's much more compliance in these training pr uh, processes. Um, so let's look at a few of these examples. So UIMM is, uh, is actually a, is a consortium in France. And they represent about 42,000 businesses uh, in France from the local you know, tool shops down the road to big ones like Safran, ADF, Total. Um, and what they do is in their centers all, all over France, they train workforces on a regular basis. So companies will uh, contract UIMM to train up their workforces in a specific, uh, for, a, for a specific certification. 
So UIMM has worked with our partner Eon Reality in, um, in deploying the first training solution in a center in Laval, uh, where they have all their students coming through this program um, going through a specific training process. Right? And from, they go from one center to, to, to many more all, all over France. The key here for them is this is not, you know, how do I use a tool? Um, this is very sophisticated training programs. And that's where AR has value. So again, think about the high value asset that you're trying to, uh, that you're trying to use or learn how to use, and then the kind of certification that you need um, uh, to work on that asset. And this is not, you know, this is not a, a single day program, but these are very sophisticated training procedures uh, where AR actually has value. Um, so here's another one from Plex, and I'll let him speak. I think we're missing some volume there. I'm going to show you how these augmented reality glasses from Daiquiri can be used in a manufacturing environment to help manage people, machines, and material in a hands-free and efficient way. As they approach the work center, the Daiquiri headset recognizes the AR marker on the wall. The marker tells Daiquiri which work center I'm at and allows me to access a hands-free virtual control panel. The Daiquiri is tied to my Plex profile, so it displays information and controls that are relevant to my job function. It can display such things as production information, performance analytics, or tasks. From my control panel, I see this specific work center is not in production due to a lack of source material. By focusing my gaze on the clock in button, I trigger the recording of my time against the work center. Next, I tell the virtual control panel I want to load source. Since we are running FIFO inventory, Plex tells the Daiquiri headset what serial number I need to load. Now, when I look at the inventory, the Daiquiri identifies the container I need to pick by highlighting it in green. I return to the work center and tell the control panel that I have loaded the correct source. We see the production status turns green and production is ready to run again. Plex sees future shop floors with people using smart devices and wearables instead of traditional PCs. These innovations complement Connect and Manufacturing and helps in making the work easier, faster, and safer. So if you look at the, the first example with UIMM, you know, you saw a nice complex 3D content, uh, you know, because there's a very learning outcome there. But the Plex example was really simple data. I mean, it's not like visually stunning, but it's extremely functional and very, very useful. The key there is also it's the, the connections uh, to their existing systems. And that was important because you're getting real lifetime data back. Uh, here's another example, Amnil Pharmaceuticals. Um, so they're, um, I think they were, the, they were the fifth largest generics producer in the US. They recently merged with Impact, so they're, I think, the third largest now. So large pharma companies. Um, and what they're using this, uh, uh, the Daiquiri devices here for uh, is really, I'm not sure why that's, OK, there you go. <laughs> Um, they, they have this facility where they produce medicines, right? And they have these things called air handling units. Now, anytime uh, certain parameters on that air handling unit goes bad or out of whack, the entire batch of medicines has to be thrown away, right? So what they're using this is to empower their workers in the field as they inspect these machines on a very regular basis to get information in a timely fashion and take action right in the field. So it's a huge benefit from really simple, um, um, simple data, relatively simple data to, uh, to visualize, but very, very powerful in a work and in a, in, a, in a manufacturing environment. Um, let's talk about closer to home, the city of LA. Um, and this is a very interesting, um, interesting use case. So you know, a lot of our uh, workforce, at least for the city, is, is aging. And they have two problems with that. One, they're not able to staff up as quickly as they could in the past. And two, a lot of that knowledge is being lost. So they have some really incredible statistics about almost like 60 or 70% of their workforce is just going to retire in the next few years, and they're not adequately uh, staffed to, to replenish that workforce. Uh, so they did a really simple thing, and I'll, I'll let them talk about it in a second, but this is, um, these, are, uh, these are headphones that emergency services workers use. Um, and there's only one person in the city that can actually service that headphones if something goes wrong, right? There's just one person. Uh, it's a contractor, actually. So they wanted to figure out a low-cost and easy solution uh, to spread that knowledge internally and to remove those single points of failure. So here's a, you know, in terms of 
just the outcomes of what they, uh, what they found, I mean, the numbers are staggering, right? And I, I'm pretty sure you've seen this throughout this conference uh, in other presentations as well, where, you know, the ROI, no one really questions the ROI for using AR in the workforce. What they do question is what's the right solution for it. And so, you know, providing the right product, um, which includes the hardware, the software, uh, and, and the user experience for that is, is critical. But the numbers in terms of either whether that's how fast I can learn something or how well I can learn it, uh, there's no question or no challenge on those. There's, there's enough data there to show that AR in the enterprise actually works and is useful. Fire department uses headsets, and these headsets help them communicate to each other as the sirens are very loud and it also protects their ears. When they get to the incidents, they're in a rush to get to the emergency, so they often will just rip the headsets off and throw them to the side, and they break, and they break quite frequently, and they could be anywhere in the 369 square miles of the city. Right now, they have to be shipped down to our central location to be fixed. We looked at augmented reality because we knew that augmented reality was being used to solve a lot of technical repair work in other industries. We also knew that it was becoming very mainstream and it's, it's seen in a lot of cars and heads of displays right now. There are more than 1,500 firefighter headsets in use and they cost us around $350 each. This technology can save the city literally tens of thousands of dollars every year. The Information Technology Agency is always looking to emerging technologies to save money and make the city of Los Angeles more efficient. This augmented reality pilot project I think is a great example of just that. The AR project helped us reduce the training for these uh, headset fixings from about an hour and a half to as little as five minutes. Augment reality is in your regular environment that you can see, you also see pieces of other reality. The most famous augmented reality is the game Pokemon Go, where you saw Pokemon characters within your own field of vision. In this case, you don't see Pokemon characters, but you see the headset, and you can pull it apart and see individual pieces, and it gives you instructions on what to do to fix that, that headset. The goal was to use existing hardware and software to tackle our problem, to speed up training, reduce the time that it takes to pair a headset and also allow remote supervision. Using augmented reality, we can do step-by-step -step repairs. You can see from start one, we will do a 3D model of animation how to repair it. There's also another option where it's a 3D model of the headset, allow you to walk around, get different perspectives of the headset. You can see inside the headset, you can expand it. But with augmented reality, you can be anywhere, anytime. We met Dacry at a local conference that our CIO was speaking at. They demonstrated their technology and their equipment and we made contact with them. We entered into a very short proof of concept with them during the summer and using a student intern in open source software, we were able to create the content and run the POC. The equipment that Dacry loaned us for the proof of concept was a helmet. During the course of our uh, test, they came out with a second module which was a goggle, much more lighter weight, much more easier to wear, and much more mobile. With nearly 40% of the workforce in the city eligible to retire in the next year, it's really important for us to really take advantage of some of the tools that would transfer the knowledge and skills necessary to, to do the business of the city. I mean, what better way to try and get the information out of one person's head into another than putting something on top of it. I think you'll find that Los Angeles is a little bit more than sunshine and sand now. Uh, we have a burgeoning tech sector that includes Google, YouTube, and Riot Games. And so you'll find that we have many opportunities to improve the way that we do our services in the city just by using the tools that are already outside there. While we started with the cost-effective solution to repair firefighter headsets, the opportunities are really endless. So, you know, you, you've seen multiple examples here, and they're somewhat bespoke in nature. There's lots of 3D content, there's some connectors to back-end industrial systems, but what does it really take to scale? Because what we've learned is that no matter how large the organization is, no matter what vertical you are in, whether you're an aerospace company or a healthcare company, there are really five tasks that you perform repeatedly. And so what we did 
is we package those five tasks into out-of-the-box, out usable, just configurable applications that any customer can use. Right? I need some help with something, so I need to show someone who's sitting remotely to help me diagnose and repair that problem. Uh, I need to scan, a th uh, create a 3D model of, of the equipment as is, because it just broke down. I need to fix it, scan it again for audit purposes. Um, I need to tag equipment uh, with maintenance data, so put virtual post-it notes everywhere. Or I need to see a 3D model of this, of this building, a building information model. Or I need simple assembly steps to guide. And each of these applications is connected to a PLM system in the back end, like Team Center, or to BIM 360. Um, the idea is to reuse assets that you already have in enterprise. We do not want you to create new assets because that is a huge barrier to, uh, barrier to deployment, right? We, you know, when we did the Helmet, which was a development platform for us, our customers would spend months deploying solutions. Today, the deployment is like reduced to like a few days in some cases, uh, in some cases out of the box, and in some cases weeks, but it's never more than that, right? So it's the idea of reducing all barriers to entry here that's actually going to let you scale in this market. Um, so again, this is just showing how WorkSense actually fits that nice thing about where you have you know, the right sort of uh, the intersection between when you have the complex task and a high value asset. Pretty much for other things, AR is actually quite less useful, at least in our experience here. Uh, so here's a quick intro to scan, uh, to WorkSense, sorry. Assembly line three seems to be down. Can you help me look at it? I need you to look at the servers on the right. We need to locate EXSI-2. Here, I'll circle it for you. Got it. Things like with tools like WorkSense, what we're really trying to do is we're preparing for a digital workforce. I, I was at a conference in April in, in Germany, Hanover Messe, it's like the biggest industrial trade fair there, and a big theme uh, from last year, the theme was in Industry 4.0. This year, the theme, was, uh, the theme was digital manufacturing, but more nuanced way, they used a term called digitalization of the workforce. And I thought initially that I heard it wrong. I, I thought they were saying digitizing the workforce, but it's actually digitalization. Because the nuance there is that they acknowledge that the human, the worker, or the workforce would never go. You know, there's, you know, there's, with all this talk about AI and automation and all that, yes, those trends are there, and those trends will have a very disruptive effect on manufacturing and productivity, but the human being at the center of all of that will never go. And so there's this realization that bringing all those technologies together and preparing the workforce for, for an even more digital future uh, is what's key. And Daiquiri is really at the forefront of enabling that. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, please, you know, we've got a booth in the expo area. I'm happy to answer any questions there or show you um, and talk a little bit more about case studies as well. Thank you.